In this video, I'm going to show you how to conduct a two-way ANOVA or a factorial ANOVA in JASP. First, we're going to talk about the data set we're going to be working with for our walkthrough, and then we're going to discuss how do you check the data to make sure that it meets the assumptions that we need it to meet in order to run our analyses, and then we're going to get into JASP and walk through how to analyze and interpret the test results. So a couple things that I want to go through. When we're conducting a two-way ANOVA, we're extending our comparison beyond just one factor like we did when we were working with one-way ANOVAs. With a two-way ANOVA, we're able to simultaneously examine the influence of two independent variables or factors on the means of our groups. It allows us the ability to explore not only the individual effects of each factor, or what we'll call our main effects, but also whether the effects of one variable depend on the level of another variable, and we'll call that our interaction. Let's quickly go over an example of a non-significant and a significant interaction. When there's a significant interaction, the effects of one variable may depend on the level of another variable. Graphically, we're going to see differences in what that looks like. So we will see crossed or non-parallel patterns on our graph if we have a significant interaction. Alternately, a non-significant interaction suggests that the effects of each variable are somewhat independent and they don't depend on the other. In this case, we'll see bars or lines that appear more parallel. Looking at the charts from a study published in PLUS One by Maria Ortiz and colleagues in 2014, the graph on the left shows levels of the dependent variable for the control group and for the diabetic group when they receive a treatment or when they don't. The bars for the control group are higher than the diabetic group in both the untreated and the treated groups. In the graph on the right, we can see that the bars are not parallel. Although the control group was higher than the diabetic group when untreated, the diabetic group was higher in the dependent variable when treated. This is what we would expect to see when we have a significant interaction. For our JAS walkthrough, we'll be analyzing data published by Alexandra Zalin, myself, and Don Johnson in 2018. We conducted a series of studies to determine if people evaluated victims of sexual harassment in a public location. In this case, we were looking at a bar differently depending on a couple different factors. So we're only going to be analyzing a portion of our overall study. We ran a, a total of two different studies. So if you're interested in this, you can see our publication to learn more and I will make sure to include a link to the publication in the video description. So past researchers have found that people are more likely to help someone who's a friend compared to a stranger when they're sexually harassed or assaulted. So what we wanted to do is learn more about a more ambiguous category of relationship, an acquaintance, someone you might know from class, a neighbor, a friend of a friend, etc. Past researchers have also found that alcohol intake impacts perceptions of victims. So we wanted to manipulate both the relationship our participants had with the victim, meaning they were to read a vignette and imagine the victim was either their friend, an acquaintance, or a stranger. And we also manipulated the alcohol intake of the victim. They were either depicted as intoxicated or sober. For our first factor, relationship with the victim, had we had three levels, stranger, acquaintance, and friend. Our second factor, victim alcohol intake, had two levels, drunk and sober. So let's get to know the data that we're working with. We recruited a sample of 247 undergraduate students from introductory classes in psychology. Students were randomly assigned to read a one of six vignettes. After reading the vignettes, students were asked to answer questions about their intention to help the victim if they had witnessed what had happened how much they blamed the victim and how much empathy they had for the victim. So for our study today that we're going to focus on the participant ratings of victim empathy. For our walkthrough, we'll be testing three different hypotheses. For the first hypothesis, we'll be asking if there's a difference in participant mean ratings of empathy for the victim by the victim's level of intoxication, so drunk versus sober in the vignette that they read. For the second hypothesis, we'll be asking if there's a difference in participants' mean ratings of empathy for the victim by their relationship with the victim, so stranger, acquaintance, friend, in the vignette they read. And for the third hypothesis, we'll be asking if there's an interaction between victim alcohol intake and relationship with the victim on participant ratings of victim empathy. So what are our null hypotheses? With two-way ANOVAs, this is the tricky part, we have three sets of hypotheses. 
Hypothesis one, we're looking at our very first factor, which is level of victim intoxication. Empathy for the victim does not significantly vary by level of victim intoxication. Looking at hypothesis one, we're talking about the main effect of factor one. We want to see across both rows, are participants who were sorted into sober conditions different in their levels of reported empathy than participants that were sorted into drunk conditions? So we are seeing, is there a main effect for level of victim intoxication on these levels of victim empathy? So hypothesis two, empathy for the victim does not significantly vary by relationship status with the victim. For this hypothesis, we're looking across our columns. We want to see, is there a main effect for relationship status? So we want to see, are participants who were randomly assigned to the stranger condition, do they have significantly different levels of victim empathy than participants that were sorted into the acquaintance condition versus the friend condition. And our third hypothesis, this hypothesis is unique to our 2A ANOVAs um, in that we're talking about an interaction. So our third null hypothesis is there is no significant interaction between relationship status and level of intoxication on empathy for the victim. So before running a two-way ANOVA, we have to make sure our data are appropriate for this analysis. So to do that, we have to meet six different assumptions. These assumptions are the same ones that we've looked at with the um, independent factors t-test as well as the um, one-way ANOVA. So we're going to go through each of these. If you don't need to know how to conduct a statistical assumptions and check for those, please feel free to skip ahead in this video. Our first assumption is that our independent variable is categorical, meaning that our independent variable is separated into multiple categories that are nominal in measure. We meet this assumption. Both of our factors, level of alcohol intake and relationship status with the victim are categorical and measured at the nominal level. Our second assumption is that our dependent variable, level of empathy for the victim, must be continuous or measured at the interval or ratio level. Participants responded to two items measuring their level of empathy for the victim in the scenario. One item was, I feel sorry for the woman in the scenario. Participants rated each item on a seven point Likert scale from one strongly disagree to seven strongly agree. In psychology, we generally treat Likert scale data as continuous, thus we meet this assumption. Our third assumption, is that participants in all six groups are different or unrelated to each other. In this example, we need participants in each cell or group to be completely independent or different from the people in all of the other groups or study conditions. So no participant can be in more than one experimental group. What I mean by that is someone who's sorted into that drunk stranger group and reads the vignette that has a victim that is drunk but is a stranger to them, they cannot also be in the group and have also read the vignette for the sober acquaintance. So we need everyone to be completely separate. And for this study, we meet this assumption. So in order to check our last three statistical assumptions, we need to move into JASP. So we're going to check in JASP to see if we have normal distributions in each of our six groups, no outliers, and homogeneity of variances. So let's move into JASP and analyze the data. Okay, so now that we're in JASP, let's look at our data and get to know it a little bit. So we have a couple more columns here than we're actually gonna be working with. So you can see we have some demographic information for age and sex that we're not gonna look at. And we've got our first IV, IV1, our first factor, IV2, and our dependent variable empathy. So you can see that empathy is here, it's measured at the interval or ratio level as indicated by this ruler. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to change the the labels for our factors just to make it our lives just a little bit easier when we go to interpret the data. So go ahead and double click here. And for label one, we're going to say low alcohol intake. And for label two, we're going to change this to high alcohol intake. And then we can go ahead and 
close, click on the red X to close the window, and then double click here on IV2. And we're gonna change each of these labels as well. So we have stranger here, we're gonna change two to acquaintance. And then we're gonna change three here to friend. And what you wanna do is always click on one of the other rows just to make sure that Jasp has got that, then click on the red arrow. So now if we scroll down, we can see everything is labeled just how we want it to be. So what we're going to do is check for our remaining assumptions. However, with how Jasp is set up, one of the things that we want to do is we need to do some filtering. So we're gonna double click on our IV1 again, and we're gonna ask it to filter out high alcohol intake, and we're only going to look across IV2, stranger, friend, acquaintance, for levels of low alcohol intake. So go ahead and filter that out, close the window. Now we're gonna go up to descriptives, and just to show you what that looks like, sorry, real quick, you can see we filtered out high alcohol intake, so all the participants that were sorted into that condition will not be a part of this next set of descriptive statistics. So click on descriptives. We're gonna move empathy, our dependent variable, over here to the variables box. And we're gonna move our second factor over here to the split box. And so what you can see is that our descriptive statistics come up for stranger, acquaintance, and friend. And this is all for people who are sorted into that low alcohol intake condition. So we're gonna click on statistics, click on skewness and kurtosis. That's gonna give us our data, our normality statistics that we wanna look at. And then we're also gonna click on customizable plots. We want to get box plots and we want them to label outliers. This is going to allow us to see for these three conditions, did we have any issues in terms of normality and did we have any issues in terms of outliers? So now that we have those clicked, let's go ahead and hide that so we can look at this. So if we look at our box plot and we check for outliers, I don't see anything. So we don't have any variables on the outside of these whiskers and the stranger condition and the acquaintance condition or the friend condition. So we're good so far. And then here for descriptive statistics, we're looking at skewness and kurtosis values. We want those to be between negative two and a positive two. The closer they are to zero, the, the less skewed they are. And so that's what we're hoping for. So we have negative 1.31, negative 0.64, negative 1.04. Five when we round it. So all of those are within that negative two to positive two, we're happy with them. For kurtosis, we want the same thing. So we have a 0.42, negative 0.16, and 0.217. So all of those look good. So for these three conditions, for stranger, acquaintance, and friend, for low alcohol intake, our outliers and our data normality are all look good. So what we're going to do now is we're just gonna go back to our data and we're going to click on our first factor again and we're gonna put high alcohol intake back in and we're gonna filter out the low alcohol intake now. So now we're gonna look at the other three conditions that we didn't look at the first time to see are their levels of skewness and kurtosis and their box plots, do they all look good? So once you have that checked, Click on the red X. We're going to go back over here. You can see that what when you update that filtering information, Jas automatically updates our output. So we are good here. So I'm just going to click on these three lines here to drag this out. So looking at our box plots, we're looking for outliers. You can see in our stranger condition, we are good. In our acquaintance condition, we're good. In our friend condition, we have some outliers down here. So you can see participant number 208, participant 242, and participant 227 all had outliers. And, and these are all participants that rated their level of empathy for their friend in the vignette as being much lower than the other participants did. So we do have some outliers in our high alcohol intake friend condition. And let's go up here to our skewness and kurtosis values. So again, we want them between negative two and positive two. So skewness, negative 0.89. 
um, negative 0.248, negative 1.488, those are all within those bounds, so we're happy. For kurtosis, we have negative 0.27, negative 0.881, and 3.683. So here in that friend condition, we have a kurtosis value that's outside of that negative two and positive two bounds. That's a bummer because that's a high kurtosis value. And one of the things to be aware of is that oftentimes these kurtosis values, if we have values that are significantly high, it's because of outliers. These outliers can very much impact those values. So what we had done is I created another data set that had the outliers removed so we could look at them there. So let's go ahead and open up that outlier free data set and rerun this and see what that looks like. Okay, so this is our other data set. This has those outliers removed and you can see the labels already taken care of for our factors. So let's go to our first factor and we're going to filter out the low alcohol intake so we can look specifically at that high alcohol intake condition and see if our um, kurtosis values have been fixed. So let's go up here to descriptives. I'm going to click this arrow to hide the data, move empathy over to the variables box. We're gonna move IV2 into our split box. So I'm gonna click on statistics and skewness and kurtosis. And then I'm going to click on customizable plots, click on box plots and label outliers. So let's look at our new output here. So you can see this has definitely been cleaned up and we have stranger friend, acquaintance and friend, and we no longer have any outliers on these box plots. So let's take a look at our kurtosis values. So 0.27, negative 0.881, and then our friend condition, negative 0.585. So that's much different and much better than what we had with the three over th level of a three. So this is a lot better. Um, the question is, is ultimately would our results for our ANOVA been different? Well, let's go ahead and run the results with this cleaned up data set without the outliers because the kurtosis has been fixed. And then we'll come back to our original data set and compare them to see if those are different. So for right now, let's go back here and we're gonna double click on IV1. We want to bring back all of our participants. So we wanna have all of the um, different conditions here open. So click on the X once that is done. And now we're gonna go up to ANOVA. So click on ANOVA and then click on the first one, ANOVA again. And what we're going to do is our last assumption is the um, homogeneity of variances. We will analyze that here. So let's put our dependent variable empathy in our dependent variable box. And we're gonna move both of our factors here into our fixed factors box. So a couple things that we wanna look at. We wanna look at descriptive statistics. Those are always helpful to have. We're also gonna ask for estimates of effect size. You can see there are three different ones here, just like with the one-way ANOVA. Um, it defaults to the eta squared, and that's perfectly fine. If you want to have omega squared, it's a little bit more of a conservative, somewhat smaller oftentimes estimate, you can do that. There's also partial eta squared. We're just gonna go ahead and look at eta squared. And so a couple other things that we want to look at here, you can see there are lots and lots of different things we can click on. Let's first click on assumption checks because we need to look at those homogeneity um, tests, specifically the Levine's test, because we want to check that remaining assumption that we have. So let's look at that. So assumption checks, test for equality of variances. Here, as a reminder, we want that p-value to be greater than 0.05. That means we meet this assumption. In our case, it's a bummer, that p-value is less than 0.001. That means we don't meet this assumption. We don't have equality of variances. And when we were working with the one-way ANOVA or the independent samples t-test, we could do a correction for that, right? With a one-way ANOVA, we just clicked on that Welch button right here and it would correct for it. That's only available with one-way ANOVAs. It doesn't work with a two-way ANOVA. 
with a two-way ANOVA, we can feel somewhat comfortable with running our analyses anyways, even if we don't meet this, if we have equal numbers of participants in all our groups. So we want to have them as equal as possible. So looking up at this descriptive table right up here, this is telling us our end size in all of our groups. So in our acquaintance high alcohol intake group, we have 42. In our high alcohol friend group, we have 38. In our high alcohol stranger group, we have 42. And in the low alcohol intake, across all three of those relationship types, we have 40. So we have approximately equal numbers of people in all of our groups. So even though we don't meet that equality of variances assumption, we have kind of a backup almost equal numbers of people in the groups to fall back on to tell us that we can go ahead and keep going. So another thing that we're going to do is we're just going to first analyze the results of these, our omnibus test and see what's going on there before we do anything else here. So with our ANOVA, we have three separate hypotheses that we're testing for, right? So our IV1, our first factor, this is level of alcohol intake. So we have our sum of squares, our degrees of freedom, we have our mean square, our F value, our P value, and our eta squared effect size. So what we're looking at for all three of these is we want to see, is this P value less than our alpha level of 0.05? So in this case, our p-value for level of alcohol intake is 0.872. That's a pretty big probability value. It is definitely not less than our alpha level of 0.05. So we do not um, have a main effect for level of alcohol intake. There is not a significant difference between the people who were sorted into low alcohol intake and high alcohol intake. We don't get to reject this null hypothesis. It's not significant. In our second IV2, we're looking at the level of relationship status. So here we can see this is our F value and this is our P value. So our P value is 0.104 that is also larger than our alpha level of 0.05. So again, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis there. We do not have a main effect for relationship status. There's no difference between the friend group, the acquaintance group, and the stranger group on these levels of empathy for the victim. And then the last one, you can see it here, has that little asterisk. So IV1 times IV2. This is our interaction term. This is the whole reason we run this analysis for the most part. We really care to see does our first factor and our second factor interact together to form something unique with our dependent variable. So our F value here, 5.427, and our P value is 0 0.005. So 0 0.005 is less than our alpha level of 0.05, so we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So our third hypothesis, that there is an interaction between our first factor level of um, alcohol intake and our second factor relationship status is true. We have a significant interaction between those two factors on participant ratings of empathy for our, the victim in the scenario. And when we look at our eta squared value, we can see that the effect size is small. It's 0 0.04. Um, but we have a statistically significant effect and practically it looks like that effect is small. So our next step here is we need to see what this means. Okay, so one of the ways that I like to kind of visualize and try to wrap my head around these interactions is to pull up a descriptive plot. So we're gonna go down here under descriptive plots and what we're gonna do is we're gonna move IV2, our second factor relationship status to this horizontal axis, that's gonna be our X axis. And then we're gonna move IV1 over here to the separate lines, that's level of alcohol intake. And then you're want, you want to make sure that the display error bars here is clicked. 
And then let's go ahead and look at this. So when we do this, we're gonna go ahead and pull this, make it a little bit bigger, easier to see. And when you can see with our key over here, so low alcohol intake has the open circles, that's this line here, and high alcohol intake has the closed circles, the dark ones. So when we were talking about looking at and interpreting these descriptive plots, remember we always have to go to our p-values and our statistics to verify anything that we're seeing here visually. But this can help you get a picture of what's happening with the data and then we can go to our tests, our statistical test, to back that up or to see if it's not confirmed. So what we want to see is when we see a lot of overlap between the error bars, as we talked about with the one-way ANOVAs, we're not likely to see a statistical difference. So in this friend condition, you can see here the means level of, of empathy. So remember our y-axis is the level of empathy over here. Mean level of empathy is really close to each other. Tons of overlap between the low alcohol intake condition and the high alcohol intake condition. You can see the high alcohol intake condition just has a little less error, but not likely to see any statistical differences between these two groups. And when we're going over here to this acquaintance condition, you can see the means are a little bit of ways, but we, and we have a little bit of overlap here. So that one, we're not quite sure. You can see that the high alcohol intake, the level of empathy was a little bit higher than the low alcohol intake. And then here in the stranger condition, we still have a little bit of overlap. Um, between our low alcohol intake condition and our high alcohol intake condition. So just looking at this, I would definitely say there's nothing going on over here in this friend condition, um, but our interaction is likely due to this difference happening here between our stranger and acquaintance. That level of empathy really dips here for the acquaintance and that low alcohol intake condition. So what we need to do is we need to run post hoc tests. So this was our omnibus test here. This tells us, is there anything happening with the data? We have a significant interaction. So to probe that interaction to, and to see what is happening, what we have to do is run simple main effects. To do that, we're gonna come over here to simple main effects. And what we're going to do is we're gonna do it two different ways. So um, the first way we're gonna put in our first factor, simple effect factor one, and we're gonna put our second factor into the moderator factor one. And let's go ahead and look at those results and then we're gonna come back and we'll switch them. So first, let's go down here. So what we are seeing here, you can see level of our second factor. So stranger, acquaintance, and friend. So for each of these, what this is doing is this is comparing our drunk versus sober essentially for the stranger condition. This is comparing um, drunk versus uh, sober for the acquaintance condition, and this is uh, comparing drunk versus sober for the friend condition. So we are going to pay attention to our p-values over here. We want to see are they less than our alpha level of 0.05 or are they greater? If they're less than 0.05, then we would say there is a significant difference between the low alcohol intake and high alcohol intake for that level of relationship. So for stranger here, we have a p-value of 0.016. That's significant. That is less than our alpha level of 0.05. So what that tells us is for this stranger condition right here, there's a significant difference in the level of empathy between our high alcohol intake condition and our low alcohol intake condition. So this, these are significantly different from each other here. Our next one is giving it to us for the acquaintance condition. So our p-value is 0.032. It is still less than that alpha level of 0.05. So we're going to reject the idea that these are not um, different from each other and say that they are. So in this acquaintance condition here, what we're seeing is that the low alcohol intake condition here is significantly different than the high alcohol intake condition here. So these two are significantly different from each other. And the last one is our friend condition. So here we have a p-value of 0.87. 
0.587, sorry. And this is definitely larger than our alpha level of 0.05. So there is not a difference between the low alcohol and the high alcohol intake on this level of empathy. So these two right here, not different from each other as we had suspected. So with simple main effects, when, when we have these two factors, we want to run this both ways. So we just looked and we compared um, low alcohol and high alcohol intake. So let's switch this up. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to, you can see for each of the there it goes, it's updating it. So what we're going to see now is we're going to see the two different levels of alcohol intake, low alcohol intake and high alcohol intake. And we are going to see relationship status compared for each of those. So I'm just making our graph a little larger. Okay, so for low alcohol intake, we're gonna look and what this is saying is that for stranger, acquaintance and friend, what is is there a difference between those so here's our f here's our p our p value is 0 0.002 that is less than our alpha level of 0 0.05 so what that is saying is that for the low alcohol intake condition so this one here with the open circles we have a significant difference between stranger acquaintance and friends so one of these groups at least is different from the other. And if we're looking across this here, we, we can't see exactly what group or groups would be different from each other. But in the stranger condition, you can see here is here are our error bars and our mean. And for the acquaintance condition, here's our mean and our error bars. We, really, we don't see any overlap here. So it's likely that these two groups are significantly different versus the acquaintance and friend has quite a bit of overlap in the error bars here and as does the friend and the stranger. Then for our last comparison here, um, we're looking at the simple main effect for high alcohol intake across different types of, of relationships with the victim. We have a p-value of 0.313. So that is greater than our alpha level of 0.05. So there is not a difference between the stranger, acquaintance, and friend groups in level of empathy for the high alcohol intake condition. So for this line here, the stranger, the acquaintance, and the friend, they are not significantly different from each other. So when we're looking at these simple main effects, we're able to look at and see, kind of break down how these th different factors may depend or interact on one another. And what we have found is, is that when we're looking across the low alcohol intake condition, there is a difference between these three types of relationships. When we're looking across the high alcohol intake condition, there is not. And we can also see that when we're looking at the friend condition, there's no difference between high or low alcohol intake. When we're looking at the acquaintance condition, there are differences here. And when we're looking at the stranger condition, there are also differences here. So interestingly, what we had found is that participants rated their level of empathy for the victim in the scenario who was being sexually harassed at a bar as being highest when that person was a stranger and when that person was sober. So they had low levels of alcohol intake. And they also rated their levels of empathy as being the lowest when the person was again sober, but an acquaintance. And so that was not necessarily what we had expected based on previous research. And so one of the other things I want to quickly show you is would these results have been different if we had analyzed the, the data set where we had the outliers included? So let's go ahead and, and look at this really quickly. So dependent variable, we're going to put empathy there. We're going to put our two factors here. Going to just click on our effect size. And, oh, I had forgotten to uncheck this. So let's unfilter that. Anytime you see an error, that's usually something that you may have forgotten to do. So that was a, a good reminder to me. 
And when we look at our results here, you can see our p-value for our first factor level of intoxication is still not significant, greater than 0.05, p is 0.732. Our p-value for our second factor relationship status also still not significant, 0.196. So we're, we'll fail to reject that null hypothesis still as well. And then our interaction term here, p-value is 0 0.008. So that is still significant, still um, less than our alpha level of 0.05. You can see that our effect size is a little bit smaller here. So our effect size here is 0 0.039 versus our effect size over here, let me find it, is 0 0.043. So in essence, the results are exactly the same, whether we included the outliers or didn't include the outliers. However, we can see that our, the magnitude of our effect is slightly bigger when we took those outliers out that were kind of messing with our data set. So if you have any questions or you want to know any more information about two-way ANOVAs, this is a, a fairly simple version of a two-way ANOVA because all of the groups were independent of each other. We're looking at all between um, subjects effects. We don't have anything mixed in here. So if you have any questions, um, please leave them in the comments.